Hey everyone, I'm Joshua Oro, the Mustang Prince, and welcome to Mustang Prince Oil Reports. Well everyone, today's episode is going to be my second mouse-related blog of 2020. If you may recall, about a month ago, my first mouse-related blog was The Secret of NIM 2, and I understand that most of you out there do not like this movie, but I consider it a guilty pleasure. Plus, it's not as bad as some films that are being released in CGI these days. But anyway, today, we're going to go over to Disney to look at a mouse movie that's been praised by then-veteran animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson as their best work since Walt Disney passed away. Released on June 22nd, 1977, the movie is The Rescuers. So, let's get started, shall we? Bernard and Bianca are two mice members of the Rescue Aid Society, an international team that operates beneath the United Nations in New York City and they come to the aid of those in need of help. After receiving word that a little orphan girl named Penny has been abducted by the evil Madame Medusa, a greedy woman seeking a rare diamond known as the Devil's Eye, the two mice set out to Devil's Bayou in order to rescue Penny and bring her back home. So, what do I think of the movie? Well... This has got to be one of my favorite Disney films from the 70s, next to such other films like The Aristocats and Robin Hood. But, to further explain why, let's move on to Mustang Notes. The movie is based on a series of books by Marguerite Sharp, most notably The Rescuers and Miss Bianca, which, unfortunately, I haven't read yet, but hopefully someday... I hope I can get a chance to read them someday. The Rescuers entered development in 1962, but it was unfortunately shelved due to Walt Disney's dislike of the project's political overtones. During the 1970s, the film was revived as a project for the younger animators, but it was taken over by the senior animation staff following the release of Robin Hood in 1973. Ever since 101 Dalmatians in 1961, animation for theatrical Disney animated films was done by xerography, which had only been able to produce black outlines, but had been improved for the cell artist to use a medium gray toner in order to create a softer looking animation line. At the end of the production, it marked the last joint effort by veterans Milk Call, Ollie Johnson, and Frank Thomas, and the first Disney film worked on by Don Bluth as a directing animator instead of an assistant animator. Other animators who stepped up during production were Glenn Keane, Ron Clemens, and Andy Baskill, who would all play an important role in the Disney Renaissance. Oh, bonus fact! One of the movie's assisting directors was Richard Rich. Before he got his directorial debut with The Fox and the Hound, and after directing The Black Cauldron, he left Disney and made The Swan Princess and other animated films. Also to note, there was a bit of controversy regarding this movie. You see, on January 8, 1999, three days after the film's second release on home video, the Walt Disney Company announced a recall of about 3.4 million copies of the videotapes because there was an objectionable image in one of the film's backgrounds. The image in question was a blurry image of a topless woman wearing nothing. The image appears twice in non-consecutive frames during the scene in which Bernard and Bianca are flying on Orville's back through New York City. 
the two images could not be seen in ordinary viewing because the film runs too fast at 24 frames per second. But thankfully, that bit was removed from later re-releases. Thank goodness. Now let's talk about the animation. And in my opinion, this style of hand-drawn animation is still very classical, despite the fact that there are little black dots everywhere. Also, in my eyes, Devil's Bayou, which is located in Louisiana, makes me think back to summer 1998, when I was on a swamp tour and petted a baby alligator. Also, while this location is mostly a vast and stinky swamp, I mean, not that I can't smell anything, but the place where Penny is held hostage is on an old, rotting riverboat. Plus, some parts about the bayou are kind of reminiscent to Pirates of the Caribbean. And no, I'm not talking about the movie, I'm talking about the Disneyland ride. Also, there are a couple intense moments in the movie, like when Bernard, Bianca, and Evan Root are caught in a strong current between two alligators named Nero and Brutus. But, the real intense scene is when the water comes inside the pirate cave while Penny and the mice are trying to get the diamond out of a pirate's skull. I mean, that's really intense for a Disney film. Also to note, there is some child abuse and gunplay in a couple scenes. Also, like with Fox and the Hound, this movie does have a few songs in it, but I really don't consider it a musical, though. But, most of them are really emotional due to the fact that they are sung by Shelby Flint, whom I've talked about in my blog of Snoopy Come Home. The first song to talk about is called The Journey, which is sung during the opening credits after Penny drops her message in a bottle into the water. In my opinion, this song is a real tearjerker, and I think it's a, it's a miracle of how Penny's bottle managed to reach New York. Next is the Rescue Aid Society anthem, sung by Bernard Fox and the Disney Studio Chorus. To me, this song is pretty much in the style of a pledge, and I think it does great when describing the RAS mission to help anybody in distress. However, while most of the song is good, one part of the song becomes off-key courtesy of a Pakistan mouse. But, the part where Bianca sings nearing the end of the song makes it feel a lot better. Next is Tomorrow is Another Day, which is sung while Bernard and Bianca travel to Devil's Bayou on Orville's back. To me, this song is my favorite in the entire film, and I think the scenery and the environments are very breathtaking and beautiful. The last song to talk about is Someone's Waiting for You. To me, this song is even sadder than The Journey due to Penny being heartbroken that she has never been adopted. Also, during the song, there is some recycled stock footage from Bambi. But aside from that, throughout this movie, there is some recycled animation that came from other films, like The Jungle Book and Lady and the Tramp. So... Now that we got Mustang notes, animation, and songs out of the way, let's move on to the characters and the voice actors. Let's start with Bernard, the janitor, voiced by Bob Newhart, who got to be in two Christmas movies, one that I love, and one that I truly despise with a vengeance. And... 
Bob Newhart also got to be in Legally Blonde too. Anyway, Bernard is somewhat cautious, nervous, and superstitious about the number 13, and he's really uncomfortable about flying. However, Bernard is proven to be very brave and courageous. Also, some folks have said that it was highly unlikely that a janitor like Bernard would become a hero, but that's what people thought about characters like Shrek or Wreck-It Ralph, and look at them now. Bianca, the Hungarian representative, is voiced by the late Eva Gabor. The voice Duchess, the wealthy female cat in Disney's The Aristocats, and she voiced the Queen of Time in the Nutcracker fantasy. In my eyes, Bianca is somewhat sophisticated and very adventurous. Plus, she's fond of Bernard, choosing him as her co-agent as she sets out to rescue Penny. Next we come to Penny, a lonely six-year-old orphan girl voiced by Michelle Stacy. Penny used to live at Morningside Orphanage in New York City until she was kidnapped by Madame Medusa in an attempt to retrieve the world's largest diamond, the Devil's Eye. To me, like Anne Marie from All Dogs Go to Heaven, Penny is such a sweet little girl. She's also shy, but rather gutsy and defiant. Also, due to her ability to talk to animals, she's really special. Penny desires to go back to the orphanage so she can get adopted, and she serves as the representation that anyone's dream can come true if one has enough faith. Also, Penny can be brave when she uses a pirate sword to open a skull's jaw to get the diamond out. And she's also pretty smart when she, along with Bernard and Bianca, hatch a plan to escape using the elevator to trap the gators, using the fireworks to distract the bad guys, and escape using the swamp mobile. Plus, the part where Penny acts like Medusa is not only very funny and entertaining, but it sounds like one of Annie's orphan friends who act like Miss Hannigan. Next we have Rufus, an elderly cat who resides at Morningside Orphanage, voiced by John McIntyre, whom, after this movie, voiced a grumpy old badger named Mr. Digger in The Fox and the Hound. While Bernard and Bianca are looking for clues regarding Penny's abduction, Rufus tells the two mice about the time when he last saw her, which was on the day when he comforted Penny when she was sad because she was not chosen on adoption day, which, in my opinion, is the most heartwarming scene in the movie. Rufus also tells Bernard and Bianca that Medusa tried to lure Penny into her car and tells them about the pawn shop that Medusa owns. Although his time on screen is rather brief, he provides the film's most important theme, faith. Next is our first supporting character, Orville, an albatross who gives Bernard and Bianca a ride to Devil's Bayou, voiced by the late Jim Jordan. In my eyes, Orville is strict, and he takes his job very seriously, and with pride. Though, I kind of wonder, how is he able to contact his tower without a headset? Fun fact, originally, Orville was supposed to be a pigeon, but after Ollie Johnson saw a True Life Adventures episode that showed albatrosses and their clumsy takeoffs and landings, he suggested that bird species instead. It should also be noted this, that this was Jim Jordan's last film role before his retirement and eventual death. 
Next up are Ellie May and her husband Luke, voiced by Jeanette Nolan and Pat Buttram. These characters are two muskrats who reside in a southern-styled home on a patch of land in Devil's Bayou. I find these two to be decent supporting characters. They want to run Madame Medusa out of Devil's Bayou for good. Also, I like that they round up their neighbors, which consist of a mole, a turtle, an owl, and a rabbit for reinforcements. Next we have Evanrude, a dragonfly whose sound effects are provided by the original head of the Disney sound effects department, James McDonald. Evan Root is my favorite character in the entire movie, and I like the scene where he gives Bernard and Bianca a ride across the swamp in his leaf boat, which is said to be the fastest boat in Devil's Bayou. Fun fact, Evan Root is named after a brand of outboard motors. Anyway, I also like the scene where Evan Root, after escaping from a horde of hungry bats, leads Ellie Mae, Luke, and their neighbors to Medusa's riverboat lair to help Bernard and Bianca battle Medusa and rescue Penny. Our next character is... Gah! Oh, <clears throat> anyway, this is our villain, Madame Medusa, a greedy, wicked pawn shop owner voiced by Geraldine Page. This evil woman is obsessed with finding the Devil's Eye, which is a rare and priceless diamond. So, she, along with her bumbling cohort snoops, kidnap Penny in order to retrieve it. Why? Well, it's because Penny is the only one small enough to fit inside the cave where it's buried. In my eyes, Medusa is a really terrible woman due to how abusive she is. Also, I think she's uglier than Ursula. And, like Cruella de Vil, she's a reckless driver, even on a swamp mobile. Plus, Medusa is insane when she tries to shoot Bernard and Bianca, and, of course, she won't let Penny out of the cave until the diamond is found. Plus, the scene where she breaks Penny's dream of getting adopted was really, really mean. I mean, what a real bitch. Also, what's even worse is, after Penny finds the diamond, Medusa attempts to run off with it, and she stuffs it inside Penny's teddy bear. Medusa's partner, Mr. Snoops, is voiced by Joe Flynn. Snoops can be clumsy and incompetent. He attempts to be a serious bad guy, but he fails miserably, and he doesn't always handle Penny's strong personality. Upon being betrayed by Medusa, he turns on her and flees by raft, laughing at her. Also to note, this was Flynn's final film role before his death in 1974, due to a heart attack he had while swimming. Finally, we come to Medusa's pet alligators, Nero and Brutus. To me, these gators are very ferocious, mean, and harmful. They show nothing but loyalty to Medusa and they hate Snoops. However, the scene where they play the pipe organ while trying to catch Bernard and Bianca is the funniest scene in the entire film. Other actors in the film include Bernard Fox, George Lindsay, Larry Clemens, Dub Taylor, and of course, John Fielder. And now let's move on to my final words. Overall, the Rescuers is a good movie. It has good animation for its time, 
The songs by Shelby Flint are emotional. Bernard and Bianca are great main characters, and they make a great team together. Penny is a sweet little girl, and I'm happy that she's finally got adopted, and she's donated the Devil's Eye to the Smithsonian Institute. The Devil's Bayou Swamp Folk, like Ellie Mae, Luke, and Evan Rude are good supporting characters, and the villain, Medusa, is such a terrible and nasty lady. Also, the movie's message about faith sometimes gives me happy tears, and I do applaud this film for being Disney's first success since Walt's death. So, this is one of many classic Disney films that you folks should watch with your families, especially if you have kids. As for my rating, I'll give it a 79% out of 100. So, I suppose you guys are asking, will I blog The Rescuer's superior but underrated sequel? Well, my answer is yes, I will, but that'll have to wait until May, because I'm going to need a co-blogger to help me when the time comes. Anyway, be sure to join me for my next blog, Mustang Power.